are familiar with the name Viktor Frankl? Show of hands. Great. So some of you will know that Viktor Frankl was a psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor who observed that people who tended to survive the concentration camps best were those who felt their lives had a sense of meaning, a purpose that compelled them to live. <clears throat> As Frankl put it, those who have a why to live can bear almost any how. This observation was so impactful for Frankl that he very quickly after the concentration camp experience wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, a now classic book in which he argues that purpose in life reduces suffering in the face of adversity and may improve health outcomes. Now, at the time, Frankel's idea sounded a bit hokey to the medical community and was largely dismissed as unscientific. Even today, it's difficult for many in the medical profession, my world, to fathom that a psychological factor like purpose in life might actually confer health benefit. But I'm here to show you with science that it's time we embrace this idea now and how we can all prosper with purpose in life. The findings I'll show you today come mostly from the Rush Memory and Aging Project. This is a study of more than 2,500 older persons from around the Chicago area. We're based here. All older people come to us without any cognitive impairment. They're not demented. They don't have overt signs of dysfunction. And we conduct detailed annual assessments of cognition, physical and neurologic functioning, psychological functioning, behavior, and so on for the rest of their lives. In addition, and what makes this study very unique, all of our participants agree to brain donation at the time of death. What this study design allows us to do is to document who develops dementia over time and who doesn't, and identify factors that increase or decrease the risk of dementia. We call these risk factors for dementia. Then, when we get the brains, we measure Alzheimer's disease-related changes and other diseases, pathologies in the brain. And we use that information to understand how risk factors work at the level of the brain to influence dementia risk. So I'm going to tell you first a little bit about what we've learned from studying more than 1,000 brains so far, about what we see in terms of the brain and what drives cognitive decline. <clears throat> When we look at older people's brains, we see that pathology is nearly ubiquitous in the aging brain. Virtually all older people who make it into their 80s will have some amount of disease in their brain. Alzheimer's disease is the most common, but we also see strokes, other vascular conditions, and a whole host of other diseases that are less well studied and less well understood. As you can imagine, these diseases are always present in people with dementia. We know this is what drives their cognitive and functional decline over time. But what might surprise you is that these diseases are also very common in the brains of cognitively healthy individuals. Those that if they went to their doctor and said, test my memory, I think I'm failing, what's going on with me? Their doctor would say, no, go home, you're fine, you're normal, you're good. In fact, more than a third of cognitively healthy individuals have enough disease-related changes in their brains that any pathologist would say they meet criteria for dementia, Alzheimer's dementia. So what this mismatch between the amount of pathology and someone's level of cognition tells us is that not all brains are the same. Some people are able to withstand a tremendous amount of pathology and yet still function very well even into late adulthood. These people are resilient. Resilience is a very important concept, particularly for diseases like Alzheimer's disease where we don't yet have effective therapies. As a disruptor, like some of you, I often argue that finding ways to increase resilience is likely the most effective strategy we currently have for reducing the burden of dementia in the population. So what do we know? What, what provides resilience? Some of you may have heard of some of the things that we see in the media and here in news outlets commonly, and we and others have identified these. For one, cognitive activity or mental stimulation. Now, the key here is difficulty. We're not talking bingo. We're talking about activities 
where the brain is continuously and progressively being challenged to work harder, work faster, be more efficient. Think chess, for example, with a worthy opponent. Similarly, engagement in physical, social, activities is also protective against dementia and cognitive decline in old age, as is uh, enjoying a healthy diet. Think Mediterranean diet, rich in fruits and vegetables. <clears throat> as we were identifying some of these resilience factors, though, I kept thinking about Frankel's work, wondering, what if it is true that somehow how you feel, that your sense of purpose, that your life is meaning and goal-directed is as important or perhaps even more important than what we do to maintain cognitive and other aspects of health as we age. Surprisingly, more than 60 years after Frankel's book was put out, there had still been no test of his hypothesis, so we set out to test that. Remarkably, we found that purpose in life is one of the most robust predictors of health and wellness in old age. Older people with a high sense of purpose are substantially less likely to develop dementia compared to those with a lower sense of purpose in life. They also have a much slower rate of cognitive decline. They don't tend to deteriorate as much as those with higher purpose, and importantly, these findings hold even after we consider those other resilience factors, cognitive activity, physical activity, social activity. Now what this suggests is that purpose in life may in fact be a stronger determinant of cognitive health in old age than the resilience factors you're hearing in the news, you're seeing in the media. We also found a very interesting story with pathology such that purpose in life reduces the effect of Alzheimer's and other changes on cognitive function. So for two people with a similar amount of Alzheimer's disease in their brains, the ones with a high purpose declined about 30% less than someone with a lower purpose. What this suggests is somehow purpose in life provides a buffer that actually counters the harmful effects of Alzheimer's disease in the brain. Purpose in life also has multiple beneficial effects for aspects of physical function. Older people with a higher purpose in life tend to have a much lower risk of developing disability, including impairment in basic activities of daily living, like bathing, as well as more complex ones, like shopping or financial management. They also have fewer strokes, fewer hospitalizations, fewer medical complications after a hospitalization. They also have a lower risk of mortality. By some estimates, purpose in life confers an additional five to seven years of lifespan. This is huge for someone who's approaching their 70s and 80s. Similarly, purpose in life has beneficial effects for multiple aspects of psychological functioning. Older people who have higher purpose tend to have less depression, less anxiety, better well-being and life satisfaction overall, and better sleep quality. In essence, purpose in life benefits all aspects of health. My challenge to you is to take this science back to your organizations and help your residents find their purpose. Now, I know this is not an easy challenge. Purpose is different for every individual, and it can be difficult to motivate somebody to start thinking about something so complex as finding a purpose in life. When we measure purpose in life, we use a standardized questionnaire that gets at things like, do you feel your life has meaning and direction? What energizes you? What wakes you up in the morning? Do you set goals for yourself? And do you work to achieve your goals? Engage your participants in a conversation. Just start that conversation. When we first bring these questions to our participants, they often say, nobody's ever even talked to me about this stuff before. But immediately, they're engaged, they're interested. They want to think through these complex issues. They want to be engaged. And remember, we all need a little nudge sometimes to get going. <laughs> Provide reminders, conversations, signs, notes, activities that encourage your residents to think what motivates them. How do they want to spend their time? Time is our most precious resource, and yet it's our most rapidly diminishing one. 
Are we doing things every day that make us move in the direction we want to? One strategy to use to, in, to help motivate older people is to leverage their expertise. This generation of older adults is among the most diverse and experienced that we have ever seen. Whether someone was an artist, a librarian, or a professor, there's a spigot of knowledge waiting to be tapped. Let them know you're interested in that knowledge. Build on that. Similarly, older adults can be the resources that our youth need. Encourage your residents to share their gifts, share their knowledge with younger generations. You can facilitate this by partnering with local schools and libraries to, to create mentoring opportunities. And finally, I'd like to introduce you to a friend, Ron Miller. <clears throat> Ron Miller is a Chicago-based attorney who, in his mid-60s, decided he needed a new challenge, perhaps a new purpose in life. Ron started something he called the Public Affairs Roundtable. And this isn't what you might expect. It wasn't a bunch of lawyers sitting around discussing legalese. Ron invited diverse thinkers to come together over a lunch meeting to talk about political and social issues of the day. That's, Ron often did this just by cold calling people. That's how I met him. One day he called me up and said, I, I think I want to know something about you and your research. Can you come over to my round table? And over time, this meeting grew to be a well-attended, well-respected meeting of high-powered thinkers in the area. Ron's attracted uh, past presidents to this meeting. Ron now it has been doing this meeting for 25 years. And in two weeks, Ron will celebrate his 88th birthday. There's no sign of Ron slowing down. He found his purpose in his round table. Ron is affectionately known via the round table as the connector in the Chicago area. He brings people together. But I think of Ron as a purpose ambassador. Ron motivates people. He energizes them. He encourages them to spark new connections, new collaborations. I encourage you to find a purpose ambassador for your organization, for your residents. When I asked Ron what advice he would offer to other older people who are seeking to find a purpose, he said, be open to new people, new ideas, take risks. I hope you will all take a risk today on the science I've presented to you and make finding a purpose for your residents a priority. If you do that, we will all prosper. <laughs>